Welcome to Exploring Computing. Today's video is Digital Images, Part 4, The Right Format for the Right Job. So what I want to talk about in this video is different image formats that you might use. I'm going to focus primarily on formats that are used on the web. In this little diagram here, we can see the primary formats that are used on the web. There's one object format that's used on the web, and that's SVG. It's a relative newcomer to use on the web, although it has been around for a while. It has a lot of similarities to HTML, so I'm going to hold off discussing how it actually works and what it looks like until after we've talked about HTML later in the quarter. HTML is the primary way of specifying the contents of a web page, so we'll be covering HTML when we cover web pages, which is probably in about four weeks or so. The main thing to be thinking about as far as SVG goes is if you can describe your image using a bunch of different geometric shapes, SVG is a great format. We talked about that last video, how object, also known as vector formats for images, are very compact. They have a lot of nice properties as far as editing goes, being able to zoom in to the image. And so this is a great choice if the particular image that you're working with will fit into the object format. We also talked about how for a lot of uses, the bitmap format is a much better choice. And in particular, if we've got something like a photograph, the object slash vector format is not going to work. And so we would want to use a bitmap format. Also, the bitmap formats have just traditionally been used much more widely on the web. There is an older object format called Flash, which was used primarily for advertising, but also for um, fun little games that were on the web. But it's been on its way out for quite a while. Um, and I do expect that it's going to be replaced completely by SVG. All right, so we've got a number of different bitmap formats. Um, in addition to the three main formats used on the web, JPEG, PNG, and GIF, there are a couple other formats that you might be interested in, RAW and HEIC. HEIC is a format that Apple uses. When you take a photograph with an iPhone, it's going to be stored in HEIC format. Uh, and RAW is a format that's specifically used on high-end cameras. Now, neither of these formats is available for use on the web, so you're going to have to convert from either RAW or HEIC to one of the other formats that we're going to be talking about today. But I do think that RAW and HEIC are going to be potentially interesting and useful for some of you, so we are going to touch on them briefly today. All right, so the bitmap format is concerned with what is the individual value of each of the colors for each of the pixels that compose the image. Now, one thing that you might be thinking is, well, isn't there just one bitmap format? You're either remembering things as objects, and you can kind of picture how we could have possibly different object formats on the basis of, well, how complicated do we want to get? Do we want to just be able to support, you know, ovals and rectangles, or do we want to get super complicated and do things like spline curves? And there are actually a wide range of different object formats that are proprietary. Uh, SVG is just the one that's uh, actually su widely supported for web use. Um, but as far as bitmap formats, isn't it just a matter of we just remember all the individual pixel values and what the colors are for those pixels? Well, it turns out that it's actually a bit more complicated than that. Even though ultimately we are trying to remember what the different values for all the individual pixels is, it turns out that there are different ways of representing the same information. So what we're going to do now is we're going to take a look at um, this example with the H that we, we saw previously when we were talking about black and white monitors. So I've got an H here uh, on my MacBook Pro, and I want to know how to describe what is being displayed on the screen. Suppose, for example, I'm trying to describe this H to one of my TAs when we're talking over the phone. How can I do that? Well, the standard approach uh, is to just think of this as a straight grid with a whole bunch of pixels. And I just go ahead and read off each of the pixel values. So I say, oh, zero, zero is off, one zero is off, two zeros off. And I proceed to read the entire first line, which is all off. I move to the second line. Um, you'll notice that these numbers actually start with zero, zero. That's pretty common in computer science. Um, so the next, the next line is line one. So I would say, oh, zero, one is off. One, one is off, two, one is off, and so on. I would get to the, the third row, which is uh, number two, since we're starting with zero, zero, one, two. Um, and I say, oh, zero, two's off, one, two's off, three, two's on, four, two is off, five, two is on, six, two is off. And you're probably, probably already sick of, of hearing this. 
Um, and believe me, if I were actually reading all these values over the phone to the TA, they would be very, very sick of it, one. And two, it would be super easy for them to accidentally get one of these on or offs wrong. So this, this particular approach works, but talking over the phone and describing it is obviously very time consuming. And similarly, storing all these individual pixel values is going to take a lot of space on, on the computer. So this is an ideal. Is there a better way to do this? Well, yeah, actually it is, there is. Let's take a look at the second approach here. Okay, so here's a second approach to describing the exact same screen. I'm talking to the TA over the telephone. I say, oh, row zero, it's all off. Row one, it's the same as row zero. Row two is the same as row zero, except for two, two and four, two are both on. Row three is the same as row two, except for three, three is on as well. And row four is the same as row two, and all the other rows are exactly the same as row zero. Okay, so I've described the exact same scene, um, and the TA is able to get the exact same amount of information as if I had read off all the individual pixel values, but you can see that this is a much more compact way of describing the exact same situation. And so it does turn out that there are different ways that I can describe what all the individual pixels are, and the first approach where I actually just read off all the individual pixel values, this is a format um, that's sometimes referred to as BMP or bitmap format. And it works, but it's very large. And because it takes up a fair amount of space in order to do it, that means if we download it for the internet, it's going to take a fair amount of time. And therefore, we don't use that format. It's going to turn out that two out of the three formats that we're going to be talking about today actually use a very similar approach to my compact version where I said, hey, you know, that row is exactly the same as this other row that we've already seen. And by combining our rows together and saying, hey, this is the same as something you've already seen, we're able to greatly reduce the amount of space this takes. This is sometimes referred to as compression because we've taken the information that we started off with, we've changed the format that we're using to describe that information. And in changing the format, we've reduced the amount of space it takes. So this is referred to as compression. Okay, so the first of our file formats that we're going to be looking at is JPEG. JPEG stands for Joint Photographics Experts Group, which is the name of the group that came up with this particular format. But I'm guessing 98% of the people that use this format have no idea what it stands for. It's just called JPEG. JPEG is designed to store photographs. So if you've got a photograph, you should probably use JPEG. In fact, most consumer cameras and most cell phones pre-iPhone switching to HEIC, just when you take a photograph, it just immediately converts it to JPEG. With iPhones, if you want to put it on the web or you want to send it to somebody that doesn't have an iPhone, you're going to need to convert it to JPEG. Often the applications are going to immediately convert it to JPEG automatically for you. So if you're going to text a, text a photograph to a friend, and they don't have an iPhone, it will automatically get converted to JPEG. Now, JPEG stores 24-bit color, so that means you have the full 16.7 million color range. Um, it does have an interesting drawback that uh, we'll see doesn't show up with all of the techniques we're going to be using. JPEG is what we refer to as a lossy compression format. So what this means is this actually loses information. Um, I've got two images of... Venice here. Um, and on the left hand side, I've got a 1944 by 2592 image of Venice. And this is 1.39 megabytes. And on the right side, I have 1944 by 2592. Again, same pixel resolution. But this image on the right is only 215 kilobytes. So the image on the right is one sixth the size of the image on the left. Now, if we're looking at these, how many of you can tell the difference between these two images? So what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and zoom in and we're going to take a close look at just one section of the image. Now, if you look at this rail running along the top of the building here on the right, you'll notice that the rail on the image on the left, that's the large size image, you can actually see the rail pretty, pretty easily. And on the right side of the image, it's just kind of this big old mess. Similarly, if you look at the guy wires holding up the edifice on the right side, they're kind of messed up. And on the left side, you can tell that they actually are wires. You can also see if you look along the edge of the roof, 
you can see that on the left, it looks clean, and on the right, it's just kind of jumbled up. So what we're seeing here is these are JPEG compression artifacts. Whenever you use JPEG, you are losing information. So as soon as you snap that camera, you're losing information, and you're getting these JPEG compression artifacts. But the thing about JPEG is we can control how much compression actually occurs. So we can say, oh, I want my image to look pretty close to what the camera is actually seeing. So I'm going to I'm going to sacrifice some space. I'm going to have a very large JPEG file with very little compression artifacts. Or I can say, you know, this thing's going to go up on the web. And I don't think anybody's really going to notice that that guy wire or that that uh, railing along the edge of that roof is a little bit messed up. Nobody's going to notice and I want a nice small image so that it will easily quickly download on the web. So. Um, Apple's new HEIC format also does compression. It does a better job with compression than JPEG. It's a newer format. Um, if you don't want any compression at all to take place, if you want to snap that image with your camera and get the exact same thing stored on your disk that the camera actually saw, that's what the RAW format is for. So high-end cameras have a RAW format that will store the original image that the camera saw when you took took the photograph. Um, other cameras and phones are going to do some compression. They'll say, well, I can use this mathematical formula that's part of JPEG or that's part of HEIC that's going to greatly reduce the amount of space that this image is going to store. And most people are not going to notice these compression artifacts at all. So let's go ahead and do that. OK, so our next format is PNG. PNG stands for Portable Network Graphics, although as with JPEG, Probably very few people know what PNG stands for. They just refer to them as PNGs. PNGs is a relatively new format. It builds on an older format referred to as GIF, which we will take a look at in a minute. PNGs and GIFs are both designed to store diagrams and graphics. So what I mean by this is they're designed to store images that are generated by hand or with computer graphics as opposed to photographs. PNGs and GIFs both use a technique very similar to that technique that we talked about earlier with the H, where I said, oh, what we're going to do is we're going to reduce the amount of space this takes by looking at sections which are exactly the same. So if you think about a photograph, there really aren't parts of the photograph where you can say, well, that pixel, this set of pixels over here in the top left is exactly the same as the pixels on the, on, on the right. So you know, maybe you can say, well, this section is all ocean and it's more or less the same, but it's not exactly the same. Whereas on a diagram, you can definitely say, well, this line on the diagram is exactly the same as this other line in the diagram, or you know, this section up here is exactly the same as this other section. And so that's really the way PNGs and GIFs work. They're looking for those sections that are exactly the same. So you can take a photograph and you can store it as a PNG, but it's not very efficient. The JPEG format and the technique used for the JPEG compression is specifically designed for photographs, and it's designed to store photographs efficiently. The PNG technique and the GIF technique is specifically designed to allow you to store diagrams in an efficient manner. In contrast with the JPEGs, though, the PNG format is not lossy. So, you know, just as with our H example, where you know I changed how I was describing the H to the TA, and even though I was describing that H in a different way where I'm like, oh, that line's the same as the next line. Uh, these four lines here, they're exactly the same. Um, these pixels here are the same as this other section of pixels over there. You know, if, if I'm describing the image to the TA in that manner, I'm not actually losing any information. I'm just changing how it's being described. They are still able to reproduce the exact image that we started with. And so that's the way PNGs and GIFs work. They're going to be able to give us an exact reproduction of the original, but they're going to take up less space than actually storing each of the individual pixels. Now, PNGs and GIFs do have uh, another interesting feature that's not available in JPEG. And this is the ability to make some of the individual pixels transparent. So let me show you how this works. So what we've got here is we've got the Stanford seal and I'm showing it over a white background. And you can see that the seal fits in very nicely here and it looks like it matches really nicely. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna take the Stanford seal and put it on a gray background. And you can see that what's happened here is I can see that the seal, even though the seal is a circle, I can see that I'm actually taking the seal along with the rectangle surrounding the seal. And so the white background is really gonna show up here. So what I'm going to be able to do with 
PNGs or GIFs is I'm going to be able to designate certain pixels as being transparent, which means whatever is behind it will show up instead of uh, worrying about what, what is in the diagram itself. So um, here we go. You can see I have a transparent version of the seal where I've gotten rid of the parts of the rectangle that aren't directly inside of the, the circle and the seal. And you can see I've gotten rid of the interior of the seal as well. And so I can put this over a variety of different backgrounds. So here it is in front of gray. Um, you'll recall last lecture, uh, we talked about creating colors like sea green. Here it is in front of sea green. Here it is in front of tomato and burly wood. And so I can put this seal in front of lots of different backgrounds and the pixels that are marked as transparent will go ahead and show whatever's underneath them. In most editing programs that when you're working with a format that does support transparency, the transparent sections will show up as a checkerboard pattern. So this is what the seal would look like with no transparency. And this is what the seal looks like with transparency in Adobe Photoshop. Okay, we've got one last format that we need to cover, and that's GIF. GIF is famous because it allows us to create small animations. Um, this is essentially a series of still images packed together into the same file that are played one image followed by the next image followed by the next image. So this isn't really full video. Uh, video formats are a bit different and they're going to be more efficient if you've got a whole bunch of video that you want to shoot. You don't really want to use GIF for, for anything particularly long. Um, GIF actually can be replaced now by animated PNG, but support for animated PNG is relatively recent. Um, there's still a lot of web browsers out there that aren't going to be able to show your animated PNG. So you know, if you want everybody to be able to see your short little animated loop, you should go ahead and use GIF. GIF as an older format only supports 256 colors as opposed to the 16.7 million colors we've been using. So you'll notice that a lot of GIFs seem a little bit pixelated and that's because they don't really have quite as many colors as you would want in order to provi provide a really nicely done scene. Um, they do support transparency similar to PNGs, um, but really they've been overtaken by PNGs. The main reason why you would run into them is these short little animated loops and they actually do show up as, as you've probably seen quite a bit on the web. All right. The next lecture will be our last lecture on how computers represent information. And in that lecture, we're going to take a look at how computers represent sounds and music. I'll see you soon.